Here we go. So happy Thursday, everyone. I know that we're off our rotation a little bit uh, by, by meeting on the second Thursday instead of the third Thursday of the month. But um, in case you are unaware, please be sure to register for our virtual gala next week on the 21st. Um, if you don't have that information, I will drop it in the chat. Um, but in the meantime, it is my immense pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Rogelio Sainz, who has been a great friend and ally to catch the next. He serves as the chair of the board, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he is also a former dean of the College of Public Policy at UTSA. He's a full professor um, at UTSA. Um, and he has also um, given some incredible presentations to us the last few years around um, changing demographics, about um, the ways that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic impacted Latinx uh, communities in particular. And given that uh, the new census just came out about two months ago, uh, I have asked him if he could give a presentation on the new um, 2020 census and what sort of implications that has for our work or, or just for um, existing and in, in how um, daily life will play out as a result of these um, of these census results. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Dr. Sainz. Okay, thank you uh, very much, Erin. Buenas tardes, good afternoon. And it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you for the invitation, Erin. Uh, I very much enjoy uh, speaking to uh, catch the next. And I think uh, it started maybe, well, with the COVID, I think uh, Maria had invited me back in, it seemed like uh, ages ago that it was uh, back in, I think it was about May or so, the early data that were, that were coming out. Uh, so what I'm gonna be doing today is highlighting some of the, um, the trends that are going on with, uh, with respect to uh, COVID in the Latino community. Some of the early findings, uh, what we were learning at the beginning and kind of the uh, current and uh, and latest trends that we see, some some major shifts that have taken place, and then also uh, highlight some of the major uh, trends that are going on with the uh, with Census 2020. Uh, indeed, one of the most challenging uh, decennial census ever uh, because of the pandemic and a variety of other things that were that were going on that I'll cover in a few minutes. Uh, so let's see if I can get this to work. Uh, it, did work well ago. Ah, here it is. So uh, I'll provide. Uh, let's see the. Um, let me do this here. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the outline is again. I'll talk about about the COVID nineteen trends first, and then talk about the uh, twenty twenty census, and in particular the purpose of the census, the major challenges, uh, what the allocation of congressional seats looks like, and then trends that are taking place nationally and and in Texas. And then the big thing that it's going run on right now is the redistricting here in the in the state of Texas and throughout the, uh, the country. Um, and the way I started uh, doing work on on COVID, uh, this was at the time then that we we're uh, in lockdown and we we're all trying to find out what was going on uh, all over the the country. And at this point in time, we're talking about late March and early um, and early April. And at that time, there was a lot of information that was coming out, thank, thankfully to the New York Times, the Washington Post, and then the Guardian was doing a, a wonderful job of covering what was going on in communities of color. And it was very apparent as people were losing their lives and we're seeing, as the picture shows there, the bodies that were, that were piling up and so forth in New York and the uh, city and the surrounding areas, New Jersey and so forth that it had hit people of color uh, much more so than the, than the white population. Uh, and, but one of the things that was coming out is data were starting to, to come out that was comparing, for example, the presence of uh, African-Americans in places like Milwaukee, places like Chicago, New York, uh, and so forth, and how they were being uh, uh, disproportionately impacted among those people who were catching the virus as well as dying from it, but there had been little work on the, on the Latino uh, population. And that's when I had discovered um, a link uh, in, uh, in the web, in uh, the internet by Black Lives Matter. 
and it was a um, an Excel file that had links to each of the state portals that had data on race. So I started going into those and updating the the uh, the data and uh, and initially wrote for um, for Latino Decisions a blog the first few months where I was uh, discussing the trends that were going on, what what we were finding out, and then for others, Latino Rebels and the Pointer, uh, which is based in Tampa, and they had invited me to do a couple of essays. Uh, one was in August 2020, at the time then that, if you recall, here in San Antonio, in the Valley, Houston, uh, that, uh, that there were so many, the hospitals were filled. It was one of those uh, probably second surge that took place in, in, in August. Uh, and then in the uh, Express News, San Antonio Express News and Dallas Morning News. Uh, and then have, I've been continually uh, following and, and doing data analysis. Uh, first of all, then it was the COVID racial data tr tracker that was became very valuable because instead of having to go to each of the state portals, they started putting the, the data together and they had a lot of information and you can imagine the resources that it took. And so for the challenges, and I think that they probably stopped um, compiling data probably about seven or eight months ago. And now it has been the CDC that has been the primary um, provider of data, although it's uh, generally um, uh, limited to death data and to some extent, uh, some of the vaccination data. And some of the early findings that were taking place that were becoming obvious is that there were two stories that were going on in the Latino community with respect to COVID, one of them having to do with uh, infections and then the other one having to do with, uh, with deaths. And here I show this, uh, this, uh, uh, this table that shows um, on the top row, it's the states where Latinos are overrepresented among COVID cases and at the bottom where they're overrepresented among uh, people who are dying from COVID. And very early on, it was very apparent that across all the states that had data, Latinos were disproportionately overrepresented, uh, indicating uh, that people were on the on the front lines as essential workers. If you recall the outbreaks, for example, in agriculture, in meat packing, uh, and a variety of other kinds of uh, industries. Uh, and but what, one of the things that was apparent is um, is and one of the things that one of the states where Latinos were underrepresented was in the state of New Mexico. And the reason why that was taking place is that um, um, disgracefully for the uh, indigenous peoples of, uh, of um, New Mexico, they were devastated in terms of the, the rates at which uh, they were dying. And one of the things that we found was in terms of the, the death rates here, uh, Latinos tended to be underrepresented in May 2020, it was only the state of New York, few more in June. And then by the time that we're talking about uh, what was happening here in Texas, San Antonio, the Valley, and so you can see there, there were 21 states that were overrepresented. But for the most part, even by February, there was only about six uh, uh, places where Latinos were overrepresented. And this had to do with the age structure of the of the uh, Latino population, we know that Latinos are a very youthful population compared to whites. So um, the age structure there at the bottom, age sex pyramid, shows you how youthful the Latino population is, with a very wide bottom, with more younger people, and then with the white population, it's got those bars where it's an aging population. Baby boomers are a large part of the of the white population at the national level and relatively low bar, small bars at the, at, the, at the bottom, indicating relatively few children. In fact, there are more elderly persons, 65 and older among the white population compared to uh, children. Uh, whereas in the Latino community, almost one out of every three uh, Latinos are uh, less than 18 years of age and persons 65 and older account for less than 8%. So it was very clear that whites were over, were clustered in ages that were associated with higher levels of mortality. And Latinos were, were in the younger ages. And once you started ad adjusting for those differences, the picture became very clear. Uh, so we can see here, these are data for September 2020, all the way from uh, early uh, January to September 2020. 
And we can see that once you take age into account, um, blacks were dying at rates that were 3.4 times higher than the white population. Latinos were dying at rates that were more than 3.1 3 times higher, Native Americans 2.5 times higher, and even the Asian population that has traditionally had very low uh, for, uh, mortality rates compared to whites were still dying at rates that were close to 50% higher than the, than the white population. And one of the things that, that also became apparent uh, was that Latinos uh, for long, for the last three decades, have died at rates that are lower than the white population and Latinos live longer than, than the white population. And this is what is called the uh, Latino paradox or the epidemiological paradox. And um, what I was keeping track was the extent to which that particular paradox was going to disappear as we saw the devastation that was taking place in, in the Latino community. So um, I did a, a journal article with um, former student, and uh, now he's a professor at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, and now is at uh, Syracuse University, Mark Garcia. And we did uh, a study where we examined the Latino paradox and what was happening to it at the older ages, 65 and older, 55 to 64, all the way to 85 and older. <clears throat> and it seems, again, that paradox is that despite high levels of poverty, low, lower levels of, of education, working in more stressful, more dangerous occupations, um, and also uh, higher rates of diabetes, for example, obesity, not having healthcare insurance and so forth that Latinos uh, live longer than the white population. And one of the things that we were looking at was in terms of the COVID deaths, and it was very clear that with COVID, uh, in the lighter um, category, you have whites, in the middle, you have Latinos and then blacks in the, in the darker shade. And it was clear that across the age groups, Latinos and blacks were dying much more at higher, much higher rates compared to the white population. And if we look at all other deaths that were not COVID, uh, there for the Latino population, the paradox held at each of the age groups, 55 to 64, 65 to 74, 75 to 84, and 85 and older, Latinos were dying at rates that were lower than the, than the white population, as had been for the last 30 years with the, uh, with the Latino paradox. And then what we were very much interested in was the overall causes of death. And there we were seeing that it was a shrinking Latino paradox. And already at the 65 to 74 uh, age category, Latinos were dying at rates that were higher uh, compared to, uh, to, the, uh, to the white population. Whereas a year earlier, uh, Latinos were dying at rates about 25, 20 to 25% lower than the white population. And this shows you some of the changes that have taken place at that particular point in time. We suggested that the age group 55 to 64 was also going to experience the, the dim diminishing uh, Latino paradox and also the 75 to 84. As you can see, that first entry is the time that we were uh, doing the analysis. For the 85 and older, you still had uh, um, major advantages in the Latino population. And we see that for the 65 to 74, the group that already existed at the time that we wrote that article throughout the period, uh, different time periods, almost monthly, uh, uh, Latino 65 to 74 have been dying from all causes of death at higher rates than the white population. And we saw with the 55 to 64, that uh, age category between May and, uh, and between um, January and May of 2021, the uh, paradox diminished, but it has returned to a certain extent, but very, very, uh, uh, very small advantages. Uh, and some of the factors I think that have to do with the shifts that we have seen have been that uh, Latinos and African-Americans, Native Americans were hit tremendously hard very early. And then we've also had, uh, we've also seen one of the major shifts that we've seen has been an increasing deaths uh, in the white community, uh, particularly with the opposition to vaccinations, particularly in solid red states uh, where the vaccination rates are, are very low. And some of those gaps that we saw that were very wide 
early on have begun to diminish somewhat. And another thing that was also uh, a major surprise because we didn't pick it up from just listening to the mass media. The mass media was talking about how it was that Latinos were very much underrepresented among the vaccinated. And that was the case, I think, early on where Latinos, because we're much less likely to be 65 and older, uh, we were in the line way, be, way back. Uh, so we, we didn't have the vaccination. And then there were the, um, the transportation issues, all those regular kinds of issues. But I think that uh, in the last several months, probably the last four or five months, data are increasingly showing that Latinos are getting the vaccination at rates that are, that are relatively high. And particularly here in Texas, along the Texas border, uh, and these are places where uh, COVID death is not something that is theoretical because these are individuals who had loved ones, family members and friends who have died from, from COVID. And there are other parts of the, of the country uh, in the Washington DC area in Maryland, for example, some of the highest uh, vaccination ra rates in the Central American population there in the very, um, very successful use of mass media and cultural kinds of images that were used to try to get uh, increase the vaccination rates among Latinos. Um, and then with the older population, 85 and older, uh, we see that, that uh, uh, the paradox continues to hold uh, and there may be something about that particular group, per perhaps selectivity or something that is associated with better outcomes during COVID compared to other age categories. And what we've seen now, now from for now almost two years from January to September, uh, there are some unexpected kind of findings. And we see that in the age group zero to, 20, zero to four years of age, children less than five years of age and youth between 15 to 24 years of age, here you also have Latinos dying at higher rates compared to the, uh, to the white population. For all other groups, with the exception of 65 to 74, Latinos are dying at somewhat lower, uh, lower rates. And um, the impact that COVID has had is that in 2019, overall Latinos were dying at rates that were 29% lower than the uh, white population and the period between January 1st, 2020 and uh, the end of September uh, 2021, uh, the advantage is only 9%. So you can see the impact that, uh, that it has had. One of the, um, one of the most interesting uh, analysis that I did, uh, I had gotten contacted by a um, reporter at the, um, at the um, uh, Dallas Morning News, and she was putting together an analysis on the impact that uh, COVID had had disproportionately on African Americans and Latinos. And she asked me a very interesting question, and that was how many person years had been lost uh, to COVID in Texas and how many of those lives were uh, Latino and, and African American. So I did the analysis doing life table survival rates uh, and uh, life expectancies and the number of deaths by ages. And there, you can see that up to period, and this is, this would have been January, 2020, all the way to early December, early to mid December, 2020. And for each person, it would have been how many more years on average would they have had a, in, in life of life if it wasn't, if they didn't die from COVID. Uh, and there were about 405,000 uh, person years that had been lost. On average, a Texan who was dying at that time was losing would have had another 18 years of life. And we we're seeing there that because Latinos are younger and they also live longer, that on average, a Latino person that had died in Texas uh, by during this period was losing, would have had an additional 20 years of life. And the, the data were showing that about three out of every five years that had been lost to COVID in, in, the, in the state of Texas were, were Latino lives. Um, I, I haven't had time to revisit this, but I hope to do uh, a, another analysis to see what, what's going on since then. And another uh, area where I highlighted was uh, what I call the milestone of misery. And this was when uh, the Latino population reached 100,000 uh, deaths. 
and this happened in uh, in April, early April of uh, 2020. Uh, more than 100,000 U.S. Latinos had died from uh, from COVID-19. Now um, we're closing in on the 125,000 uh, um, number, and the paragraph starts with the essay: "Is more than 100,000 U.S. Latinos have now lost their lives to COVID-19." This past week, we went over this lament lamentable uh, uh, threshold. It took about 10 months for 50,000 Latinos to die from the pandemic, but it only took four months to add another 50,000. So you can see the momentum that was building up with the, uh, with the pandemic. And some of the ongoing and, and latest trends, uh, as I mentioned, some of the narrowing of the gaps that we saw early on where people of color were tremendously hit early and then um, whites were protected um, uh, much more than other populations. They were more likely to be working at home compared to people of color. And uh, how you see in those, those um, uh, erosion of those gaps, they still are tremendously large, but they weren't anywhere, they aren't as uh, where they were earlier. So we can see, for example, at three points in time, and this is all age adjusted death rates due to COVID for Blacks, Latinos, American Indians, and Asians at three points in time in September 2020, in April 2021, and then um, uh, in September 2021. And we can see the tremendous changes, particularly in the African-American community. As you can see, a, a year ago, uh, uh, Blacks were dying at rates 3.4 times greater. And then uh, the last two time periods still significantly higher but but much uh, uh, but much less 1.9 times higher than than uh, than the white population, and then with the Latino population, you can see we're going down from 3.1 to 2.4 to 2.2, and then one of the um, um, differences here is with the uh, with the Afri with the Native Amer American population that by the time we're talking about April uh, and maybe a little bit earlier they surpassed uh, Latinos with the highest uh, COVID death rates and they continue to be relatively high. And then we've seen uh, uh, significant shifts in the, in the Asian population getting hit very early in New York and other locations. Uh, and now they're dying from COVID uh, at a rate that is lower than, than the white population. And we have seen that at all of the age categories, even now uh, that if you look at the rates at which Latinos are dying compared to the white population, uh, it continues to be relative, extremely high, particularly in the age groups from 15 to 24, but 25 to 34, up to 55 to 64. And these are the working age populations. Again, people that, are, that have been much more likely throughout the pandemic to have been continued working, working on the front lines in essential jobs and uh, at higher risk of cap catching the virus and dying from it. And then some of the consistent and slightly changing demography of uh, COVID-19 uh, um, mortality. And this is very interesting because for most of the, of the pandemic, I would say until about the last six months or so, for the white population, uh, about 88 to 90% of whites who died from COVID were individuals who were 65 and older much less so in the Latino community here in blue. You can see that older individuals, 61% uh, of Latinos who have died from COVID were 65 and older, 67 in the, in the black population, 58% in the uh, Native American population. And my contention is that these are workers who are dying. So in the Latino community, for example, people 50 to 64 years of age, 27% uh, were, uh, uh, in that age category, 24% in uh, Blacks, 28% of, uh, of, um, of Native Americans, but only 13% of, uh, of whites. And then at ages less than 50, you can see 15% of uh, Native Americans were less than 50 years of age, 12% among Latinos, but only 3% in the white community. Uh, and these have been changing somewhere here now with the elderly population, 65 and older, it's 84 as opposed to the 90%, because then you have more of the younger people that haven't been vaccinated uh, that among whites that are dying, particularly in those solid red states where it's a younger population that is, uh, that is being impacted. 
And then we've seen uh, across uh, states, we've seen some of the changes that have taken place in terms of uh, as they go from states with the highest death rates so that at the time uh, that we're talking about last, around uh, Christmas time, 2020, New York and New Jersey uh, were still among the top two. Uh, and then District of Columbia has been one of the highest uh, and it has been the highest death rates for Latinos in, in April as well as the current. And Texas has also uh, moved from fifth in the first two time periods to number two uh, um, early on. And it continues to be the fact that in Texas and California, it's the two states where Latinos, there are more Latino deaths than there are uh, white deaths as well. And uh, then here, these are the latest data for, for the state of Texas. These are data up to deaths that took place in the first week of October of 2021. And you can see Asians have the lowest death rates from COVID followed by whites, uh, followed by blacks, and then the Latino population is the highest. You can see um, uh, more than twice as high uh, death rates for, for Latinos compared to the, to the white population. So that gives you kind of a in-depth kind of overview of uh, what's happening, what has been happening. And, and it's interesting, I didn't have time to, to show, but the, the surges over time you also see are, are very interesting uh, and it shows very clearly where whites were protected very early on from the surges that were taking across other age groups and more we're seeing now with whites, we're seeing some of the surges that are taking place in the last five, six uh, months that are associated with the, um, the uh, not having the, the vaccination. So the 2020 census, uh, and again, just a few um, point, important points and the purpose of the census uh, but from the constitution is that um, the major purpose is the, um, the apportionment of US congressional seats. So 435 congressional seats, every state receives one. And then from the rest of them uh, are allocated on the base of the population size. Uh, so very important to get counted. And then the other major uh, purpose of the census has been the, the distribution of federal funds about $1.5 trillion that are distributed every year uh, on the basis of the size of the population for states as well as communities, counties, and, and so forth. Uh, so I always say that those these numbers have a long shelf life uh, because if you get undercounted, that is going to have a major impact across a 10 year period. And what happened in the, in the apportionment of the representatives you can see in, uh, in the purplish uh, lilac color, there were uh, a number of states, two, four, six, uh, seven states, I believe that experience that lost a congressional seat. California was, uh, was a big one. In fact, California was projected to lose two congressional seats, but they put a lot of efforts in trying to get the count out, people to get counted uh, and, uh, and so forth. And the others are these kind of more rust belt kind of states, uh, including New York that has been growing very, very slow. Uh, and, and then the winners were uh, North Carolina, Florida, Montana, Colorado, and Oregon where they got one congressional seat. And then Texas was the big winner where Texas added two congressional seats uh, to come up with, now with 38 congressional seats. Texas was projected to, to gain three uh, many, including myself, feel that uh, that Abbott didn't put money uh, to get people to get counted. He was not encouraging. He didn't take the bully, bully pulpit to get people to go get counted because of what that meant for Republicans. Uh, and so uh, Texas ended up with two congressional seats. The other state that seemed to have lost, uh, they were projected to get gain one congressional seat, but they didn't get it, is the state of uh, Arizona. So that was uh, the outcome from the congressional uh, uh, reapportionment. Uh, and then some of the national trends, and these are the big pictures that are taking place at the US level. Very clear that, uh, that as has been in the past, Latinos have been the primary driver of, uh, of the US population change. And we see here at the national level, um, about one out of every 
a little bit more than one out of every two individuals that were added to the to the uh, U.S. population were Latino, and now Latinos represent 18.7 percent, almost 19 percent of the nation's population. We're getting to that close to that one out of every five in in the country, and this contrasts with 1980 when we represented one out of every 16 or just 6% of the US population. Uh, one of the first things, that, one of the first times that we've seen in, in well, the, the only time that we've seen the white population decline was in the 2020 census, where there was a decline of the white population as demographers had been projecting because of the aging of the population. Uh, and for the first time ever in the history of the United States, the white population has gone under the 60 percent mark. Uh, and what we've seen is the major growth took place in the Asian population, in the multiracial population, as well as the Latino population. And an interesting trend was that among Latinos, and if you recall, Latinos are not a racial category, uh, we saw a major decrease, about 53 or 57 percent decrease in Latinos who classified themselves as white. And there was a major increase in Latinos who classified themselves as multiracial, some other race, as well as American Indian or Alaska Native. And I can talk about that in the question and answer, some of the mechanics that are associated with some of those shifts. And the big picture is that the US population is becoming much more racially and ethnically diverse, that the US population is getting much older, particularly among the white population, but especially as the baby boomers started reaching age 65 in 2011, all the way to 2029. And then that the population is growing at a much slower pace compared to uh, earlier per periods of time. Uh, we're resembling now increasingly European populations that are aging, that are slowing down in population growth, uh, countries like Japan, Taiwan, and, and other such countries. Um, and at the Texas, in Texas, what we see in some ways, the echo of uh, what took place at the national level, also here in the state of Texas, a bit more than one out of every two people that were added to the Texas population were Latinos. Latinos almost uh, are the same number uh, as uh, whites. Uh, Latinos now represent 39.3% of the Texas population versus 39.7 uh, for the white population. And demographers suggest that some later on in 20, in the next month or two of uh, 2021, and definitely it, it, by 2022, Latinos will outnumber whites uh, in, uh, in Texas. Uh, Texas added 4 million people uh, between 2010 and 2020. Uh, it was the, it gained the most absolute number. And it also was one of the fastest states growing by about 15%. Um, uh, it was one of the fastest growing states in, in the country as well. Uh, of that growth of uh, 4 million people, uh, Latinos accounted for about half of uh, that growth. So about 2 million people that were added to the Texas population. P persons of color, uh, Latinos, Blacks, Asians, multiracial, other, accounted for 95.3% of the uh, uh, Texas population growth, whites for 4.3%. And I've done the calculations to illustrate the immense difference in terms of, um, of, uh, of uh, a scale. And that is that um, between 2010 and 2020, um, Texas added the equivalent of the cities of Houston and San Antonio in people of color to, to its population versus it added the city of Brownsville and the border uh, with the number of whites that were added to, 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 the, uh, to the Texas population. You wouldn't think these uh, figures uh, came out from the 2020 census when we look at the redistricting maps that, uh, that uh, Republicans have, have drawn in the past um, a few uh, weeks or, or months. Uh, the big picture is again, at, like at the state, le at the U.S. level, uh, Texas is already much, much uh, more diverse than the than the nation. We've already been there for a long time, and the growth that took place in uh, Texas was in the major metropolitan areas, 
and their surrounding suburbs in San Antonio and Austin, uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, and um, and um, and um, Houston. In fact, about 85% of the overall growth of the of the Texas population was concentrated in about 32 or 33 uh, counties in the state. Uh, and it is very clear that Texas Triangle is really the major driver, the population growth that is taking place, and particularly the San Antonio Austin corridor, where we're really seeing, particularly across the, the, the suburban uh, places, uh, New Braunfels is about the third fastest growing uh, state uh, uh, cities, uh, suburban cities in the in the country. And then most of the state of Texas experienced population loss. There were 142 of the 254 counties in Texas that experienced population decline between 2010 and 2020. And there were 198 uh, counties in, in Texas that saw uh, that had fewer whites in 2020 than they had in, in 2010. And right now it's the redistricting that is, that is taking place. And I say here, Republicans didn't get the memo about the, the population shifts. Uh, what we've seen with the uh, Republican drawn house maps, the, the congressional house, the, the house maps for Texas, as well as um, a, a congressional uh, at the national level and within the state as well. Uh, it's showing that uh, whites will, if they continue with those maps, that they will gain political power. Uh, and people of color, again, that were responsible for 95% of the growth uh, are uh, scheduled to to uh, decrease uh, their their potential political power, uh, particularly in terms of majority minority uh, the districts. Uh, so those that process is still underway, and the um, the be the betting person's um, um, situation is that there's going to be uh, numerous lawsuits that are going to be taking place. Uh, over the next month and possibly lo longer. And with that, uh, uh, muchas gracias. And I'll take on any, take, take any questions or any comments that people may have. Thank you, Dr. Sines. That was all just very, very fascinating. And um, I put a link in, in the chat in case folks didn't see it to uh, the work on the disproportionality that, that Dr. Sines had done with Dr. Garcia. Um, so that's available. Um, it's not behind a paywall, so everyone should be able to access it. Um, so there is a comment from Anne. Uh, she says, the plan for redistricting is terribly discriminating and I hope I don't feel we have enough power to change it. I hope the lawsuits will work. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's going to be the the hope because uh, I doubt very seriously that uh, that Republicans are are suddenly going to have the aha moment. There was a, an article that today in the uh, in the in the um, uh, San Antonio Express News. Uh, one white um, Republican was talking about the, the extent to which he's aware of the the. Uh, of all, all these things in terms of equality and things like that. But the, these are really, it, it, it sounded like the, that they were being forced to do this kind of work out of necessity, they were doing this and so forth. So we're going to see these. Um, and unfortunately, as, as we know that uh, in the court system, much of the, many of the judges that we have in, in the state or in the, in the district, uh, are Republican controlled as well. So there's, there will be those, those challenges uh, as, uh, as well. Um, one question I had, you mentioned that, that one of the consequences of the census is that there's about, I think you said about a trillion dollars of funding that gets disseminated nationally mm -hmm. um, that's based on census numbers. So what, um, how does that impact ed education? Like what funds are those that, that may impact education? Yeah, e everything from Head Start all the way to Pell Grants, all the way to, to uh, the infrastructure for uh, education for any kind of uh, educational support programs that are federally based and so forth. The streets, the roads, the libraries, uh, healthcare, food stamps, 
Uh, and sometimes I often say some people may, may think, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm immune from all of this. A and we all are in one way or another, um, we depend on particular funds as well as our, our families and, and our loved ones. It's, uh, there isn't anyone in, in the country that, that is not impacted by, by those funds. Uh, and uh, as particularly in at the time of a, of a pandemic where we're going to need every penny to survive the pandemic since we're still in the midst of it. And also when we eventually come out of it, the recovery period that is going to be taking place. And we know that there are so many avenues of life that are impacted, housing, our health, educational, the digit divide, digital divide, everything that is, uh, that is going to impact us. And unfortunately, uh, because of the challenges that we had uh, with the, in the pandemic, many disasters that have taken place that also uh, made it more difficult for to get an accurate, uh, an exact count. The uh, President Trump trying to insert the citizenship question and then also trying to not count individuals who are undocumented from the redistricting numbers. All of those played a role, I think, in terms of undercount particularly in the Latino community, as well as communities of color. There was a, an article in the Washington Post yesterday that was talking about some uh, preliminary kinds of analysis uh, by researchers, not from the Census Bureau, uh, that were uh, estimating that with the African-American population that there was a significant undercount of the African-American population and a very significant undercount of the Black children population and I suspect that we're also going to see considerable amounts of uh, uh, undercounting in the Latino uh, community. On, on top of that, all the things that were going on, the challenges we knew we, uh, that the deaths and the de devastation in uh, among Latinos in different parts of the country, but especially here in Texas, especially along the border. Uh, that uh, And so we're going to see that we're going to be receiving fewer uh, federal dollars to support these programs that is going to be necessary and that we actually have people using those uh, services in addition to not also being underrepresented when it comes to uh, political representation uh, as well and top off that with the gerrymandering and so forth. Yeah. Um, if I uh, may uh, say first of all, uh... We're very proud that you're um, part of our board and one of our scholar mentors. And we truly appreciate getting um, firsthand uh, research from you uh, that really keeps us abreast of what's going on uh, in the state and the country. I have a kind of like two sets of questions. One regarding the vaccine. Do you foresee that the vaccination of younger children uh, making a significant difference to our numbers as uh, 2020 uh, progresses. And uh, so that's one. The other question pertains to population growth. I noticed that you mentioned um, the Austin uh, San Antonio corridor as one of the ones with major growth. We have focused on um, key metro areas in our work, as you know, mm -hmm. um, Dallas, um, Austin, you know, San Antonio, El Paso, Houston, and, um, you know, the Valley, we kind of counted with South Texas. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if you have any information regarding growth in the other areas. Mm -hmm. um, and the other question kind of tagged to that is that, I was surprised you didn't mention Houston, although you did say Harris County is one of the largest growing. So mm -hmm. I'm just wondering about the difference between um, looking at the info as the county I was hearing, Harris County, you know, that's way that you can tell Texas is growing mm -hmm. uh, or the country and, um, and, and, you know, versus using the other. Yeah. Yeah, and, and like I mentioned, uh, that uh, you really have the, about 85% of the growth took place in those areas that 
that are the, in the triangles of the Houston, San Antonio, Austin, and, and Dallas Fort Worth. So that was a disproportion. I think where where people have concentrated on the on the on two reasons, I think why people have highlighted the the San Antonio Austin corridor is one that this is becoming an increasing reality that probably in maybe within 20 years or if not if not uh, if not sooner that we're really going to see a merging of those particular metropolitan areas where we're going to see kind of a of a mega uh, metropolitan area some like we see in places like the northeast where you have for example the Philadelphia and uh, that they're tied in across a number of states. Uh, I think that's one of the the, um, the reasons. And then the other one, I, I, I was oh, the other one has to do with the suburban areas that are experiencing the major growth in terms of percentage change, seem to be concentrated in in between San Antonio and Texas. So you have many of the, San Antonio and Austin, many of these that are growing at very uh, high uh, percentages, similar to what we were seeing. In, in other parts of Texas in, in an earlier decade in Dallas, for example, Dallas, the, the suburban communities are growing tremendously fast, uh, but now we're seeing kind of the, the rates uh, in, in the San Antonio Austin uh, corridor as well. Uh, I think for the other metropolitan areas, uh, for the other areas of the region, I think that we're, we're seeing some, uh, some change that is taking place, some growth, but there are some surprises uh, so the valley area, for example, the, um, I read the uh, the Rio Grande Guardian uh, um, pretty uh, um, uh, very much, and one of the areas that they were talking about is the extent to which you were seeing very slow population growth in in some cities in in the valley area, uh, and this had to do uh, the the valley area had done a tremendous job in getting the the count out and getting people encouraging people to, to participate in the census. Uh, and there was so much energy that was going on in the Valley. And then the pandemic came uh, and, and then the, uh, the Census Bureau, for example, what they had that they were going to be part of the community in terms of getting access to that information, contacting people and so forth, it became extremely difficult. Uh, so I, I suspect that that, is a, that played a role in this smaller population change that some of these communities in in Texas in the border experience, and one of the things that that we're seeing in in Texas with the Latino community, uh, and not only in Texas but throughout the country, is that despite the fact that Latinos continue to be the driver of the of the population in Texas and the uh, and the nation, that the Latino population is become coming slowly an older population. And that is because of our fertility. It plunged tremendously from about 2.8, 2.9, uh, 10 years ago to now we're below the replacement level at about 1.95 or something like that. Immigration, particularly from Mexico has declined tremendously as well, despite the rhetoric that we heard from, from Trump and other Republicans. So that those have been part of the equation that uh, brought about population growth. And particularly in the valley, we're seeing the, the fertility rates have gone down. Uh, and because these are established communities, now you're, you don't have 7% uh, of the population of Latinos being 65 and older, but you have 13, 14, 15% being 65 and older. So those play, uh, play a role. And I think that the last one uh, was, uh, oh, I, I thought I was going to remember all of them, but uh, I don't remember the, no, uh, oh, the, was... COVID, the COVID, the, the COVID, the, the vaccinations. I'm hopeful. Again, I have been uh, talking about how I think it was because of that, uh, that when people talk about the percentage of Latinos and other groups that have been vaccinated, that it looked worse than it was because we know that the national level and here in Texas to a certain extent, a significant portion of Latinos are children less than 12 years of age. Uh, so those haven't been vaccinated. But, uh, but I have had at least the sense that, that Latinos increasingly are getting vaccinated. I am hopeful that once the children 5 to 12 are eligible to, to, uh, to get vaccinated, that that's going to help 
tremendously in the Latino community. Children continue to be among those that are less likely to die. But we've seen since schools, uh, since schools opened, uh, the number of children here in Texas, as well as other parts of the country that are, that are Latino children, for example, that have uh, caught the, the virus or who have been hospitalized, uh, the, those numbers are, are considerable. And issues having to do with obesity for children that we see it in our own community are put at risk children. And unfortunately, uh, we've seen uh, the number of children also have, has uh, uh, a considerable number. I don't have the exact numbers here in the state of Texas, uh, but children aren't immune for, um, from it and so forth. So uh, this j just has a, a, a very beneficial um, uh, likelihood in, in terms of uh, getting the, the children vaccinated. And we're seeing uh, just reports, for example, in the African-American community that we had seen some degree of resistance because of racist uh, historical programs, the Tuskegee uh, and, and so forth that experimented on, on uh, African-Americans and people were very reluctant to, to have uh, vaccinations. And now there's uh, a number of very positive reports that are coming out uh, in the Washington Post and, and New York Times today that was reporting uh, about the increase um, uh, in vaccination rates uh, among African -Amer Americans and in per certain states, they're at rates that are uh, equivalent or slightly below uh, white. So th those are some of the positive, I think, factors that, uh, that we're seeing. Unfortunately, uh, at the time that, pe that people hesitated putting, uh, taking the vaccination, that we've seen uh, tremendous numbers of lives lost, uh, particularly from probably June, July, August, uh, that we've seen those those surges. They seem to be coming down somewhat, uh, but the vaccination is really much needed, continue, continuously getting to that 85, 90% rate uh, um, to get some degree of immunity because winter is coming. And we saw what happened last October, November, December, and January when we saw those numbers uh, increase tremendously. Thank you. I, I know I, I I just took my booster shot this week, so oh, okay. yeah. um, in hopes in hopes for a nor a more normal uh, holiday. So, um, Mona, did you have a question? I One did, time. but I really didn't want to interrupt the, nope. the, the rich conversation and the knowledge that Dr. Science was um, dropping. But mine was um, it kind of dovetailing off of Anne, you know, um, can you leave us with something that's optimistic as to what we can do when it comes to uh, influencing all of this redistricting um, uh, dilemma that we're going to be in? Because the last thing I read is there they're arguing the same playbook that they used the last time uh, when redistricting came up and they got their way. So they're thinking yeah. that this is going to be more successful. Yeah. Um, you know, what, what are some thoughts? Because, I, you know, it doesn't only affect the, the Latinx community. This also affects all minoritized people. Mm -hmm. yeah. What are your thoughts on, I don't know, I don't know. I, I don't even think that resolving it. I, I'm with Anne that there is an easy resolution, but something's got to change. Something's got to give. What is? What is? What can we do? Yeah, and it has to do with uh, holding our leaders accountable uh, and electing people who are going to look after our our uh, our interests. Uh, and the interests have, having to do with health. Healthcare is a major interest. Uh, Republicans here in, in Texas haven't, uh, or the legislature hasn't expanded Medicaid, even at the time that people were losing their jobs and their insurance. Uh, and, uh, and then the other hopeful note is in particularly in the Latino community, but you see it in other communities of color as well, but in the Latino community, 203,000 Latino children turn age 18 every year. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, some work that has suggested that relatively few schools have provided students the opportunity to register to vote twice a year that they're obligated to do. And you're beginning to see some grassroots kind of movement of people across the state that are getting the word out and putting pressure 
on principals or uh, or uh, superintendents to make sure that 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 uh, takes place and is followed. Uh, because can you imagine all that potential political power that exists there that traditionally has been uh, uh, much more difficult to to galvanize because of these efforts that have not uh, um, taken hold in terms of registering uh, uh, kids turning eight, 18. Yeah. And then to follow up on that, I, there is no really no resolution for our immigration um, policy until uh, all this is over because that would just be adding another 10 million people to the rosters. Yep, exactly. um, that, so I, I just don't see that that is even going to be a, a possibility with this administration either. Yeah, yeah. And we're seeing that, uh, that there's really no change, very little and no change. I think there was a, the New York uh, Times article today that was talking about very little change in some respects and no change in many other uh, respects, even though that was part of, uh, of the platform when the, um, the promises were being made. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, thank you. Thank you. I think today you've given us a very good reminder of the importance of standing up and being counted um, in many different ways. So thank you. Thank you for that. So we are over time. So I apologize. I uh, want to, to wrap this up as quickly as possible. Um, thank you, Dr. Sines, for, for such an important topic and, and for um, breaking all of the numbers down in regards to COVID in terms of the census and just all of the implications that ha that, that has for us, both in our professional and and daily lives. So thank you everyone. As uh, Maria put in the chat, just one more plug. We have the gala next week on the 21st and then we have the fall seminar uh, the following week. If you have any questions about that or need more information, please reach out to any of us. You, uh, you know, Ana Alanis is on the call, Maria is on the call. You can email me, um, whatever. We hope to see you and engage with you over the next couple of weeks. And the next webinar will feature uh, Dr. Rafael Castillo talking about uh, culturally relevant texts. So thank you and hope you all have a very good day, rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.